you raise your right hand for me, please? You do solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give in the cause now pending shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Thank you. Can you now proceed? Good morning. Can you please state and spell for us your full name? Dr. <coughs> Charles J. Sophie, S O P H Y. J is for uh, Joseph. Okay, you're currently employed by the County of Los Angeles, correct? Correct. In what capacity? I am the medical director for the Department of Children and Family Services. <clears throat> How long have you been in that position? I, approximately since 2003. Now, when you say medical school, what are you talking about? Four years of education from 1982 to 1986. Six. Postgraduate. Postgraduate, okay, and what degree did you obtain? Um, a doctor of osteopathy. That's a DO? Yes. Okay. What is osteopathy? And it could be, I have this big misconception, maybe the public has this big misconception that it's like massages and acupuncture <laughs> and stuff like that, and it's hocus pocus. It's like a regular medical doctor and a, and a chiropractor combined. Okay. So to be able to do manipulations and that kind of stuff. Okay, so. What I'd like you to do is explain to me what it is to be a doctor of osteopathy, keeping in mind that I, I want to be disabused of the notion that it's just hocus pocus medicine. So give me an explanation how you explain it to your patients or somebody who wants to come into you and um, is concerned that the DO is not adequate when compared to a medical doctor? I explained to them that it is a medical doctor and I explained to them that the training is the same as coursework and everything as medical, regular medical school and then in addition you have training in osteopathic medicine which is the treating of a patient from a holistic perspective where you don't look at just a cough as a cough. There's got to be an origin and an etiology. It can't just be, you know, it. It could just be a virus or it could just be a bacteria, but it also could be a dysregulation of your spine. So like looking at the person as a whole and not just writing prescriptions. And 99% of the time, most people are much more comforted to do that than to just get a prescription and walk away. Okay, so if there was some sort of lay person's way that I would distinguish, for example, you from an MD, number one, I could say that you're more than just a pill pusher, right? Yes. Okay. What you actually do is you, you're, you're able to prescribe medications, just mm -hmm. like an MD, right? Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes. But what you do before you'll start pushing pills on people is you look at the person as a whole, including potentially lifestyle issues, um, spinal issues, pain issues, things like that? 100%. 100%. Yes. So you're treating the person as a whole as opposed to just giving them a pill to resolve a symptom. Correct. Okay. Is in the general medical community, if you know and you may not know this, in the general medical community, is it acceptable for a person to seek to treat solely with a doctor of osteopathy as opposed to with a medical doctor? An MD. To my knowledge, I think it's fine, but I'm not. I'm not sure. I don't see why there wouldn't be a problem. Why there would be a problem? Okay. Well, as a doctor of osteopathy, I think you explained to me already that you can write prescriptions. Yes. Can you write prescriptions for all the same medications that an MD could write prescriptions for? Yes. Can you perform surgeries? If you so choose, or you're trained and. Okay. And if you had the appropriate training, you could perform any surgery that a medical, an MD, could perform. Correct. Okay. Is there any limitation, anything that as a doctor of osteopathy you cannot do that an MD can do? Not to my knowledge. Okay. Is there any reason you can think of why an 
a doctor of osteopathy would be um, referenced sort of in a pejorative sense? I would just guess people's perceptions or misperceptions. And in your professional opinion, would it be appropriate for someone to um, impugn a person because that person uh, was relying on a doctor of osteopathy as opposed to an MD? No. no. In fact, would that be inappropriate? Yes, I think so. Okay. So, for example, if a social worker in a court report advised the juvenile court that somehow a parent was deficient in their care of their child because they preferred to go to a DO as opposed to an MD, that would be inappropriate? Absolutely. Okay. I mean, yes, absolutely. A DO is going to take a more holistic approach to the treatment and diagnosis of a patient perhaps than an MD will just based on their training. You would, yes, based on their training, but that doesn't mean they're going to integrate that part of their training. Sure, that's going to be and an how individual they choice. Carry it. Exactly. Okay. But an MD, just based on their training, doesn't necessarily have the broad scope of training that a DO will in the more holistic issues. Correct. Okay. So if I'm looking for somebody who is going to be trained to take a more holistic approach, my search should be focused on a DO. Yes. From your position as a DO, is there anything wrong with a parent who prefers to use a DO in order to get that holistic approach we were talking about earlier? No, I do not think there's anything wrong with that. Okay. And in fact, de depending on the circumstances of the child, it may be totally appropriate, right? Yes. What are the specific identifying symptoms that you look for that could lead to the diagnosis of Munchausen syndrome by proxy? Well, I start with the actual findings or lack thereof of organic reasons for an illness in a child, usually. It's usually a child that I've dealt with, at least. And documenting that, investigating that, looking at the record, that kind of thing. And then physical and emotional, psychological evaluations to determine basic strengths and needs of the case and see if there are real organic reasons for this, if there isn't, and then just go through it and meet with the team of the doctors and the nurses and parents and family members to be able to come up with a picture to begin to then go forward. Okay. Hmm. It's a little vague for me. Let me try this because maybe I didn't ask the proper foundational question. Why don't we start with what is Munchausen syndrome by proxy? It is a form of a factitious disorder, usually parent to child from what I've experienced in my practice, that a parent will factitiously make up illnesses or tests or variations of that in order to keep a child in need of some kind of medical attention. And it's usually unconscious on the part of the caregiver parent. And that's basic, and as vague as that is, that's the basic place to start because it's a very tough diagnosis to make and it's not a very easy diagnosis to make. Okay, Munchausen syndrome by proxy is a very tough diagnosis to make. Yes. And one of the reasons that it's a very tough diagnosis to make is because oftentimes there are very technical and complicated medical um, concerns that are apparently going on with a child. Yes. Okay. Is Munchausen syndrome by proxy a diagnosis of exclusion? Oftentimes, yes. Well, is there any 
empirical test you can do to determine whether or not a person is suffering from Munchausen syndrome by proxy? Not necess not a real black and white clinical test. It's more of by things not being present. Well, in fact, if you can turn to your, I think it might be your Medline article, don't they tell us in there that in fact there is no, one, one of the problems with diagnosing Munchausen syndrome by proxy is that there is no set test that you can use to identify or diagnose it. Right. Okay. Yeah. And that, in fact, it is what is known as a diagnosis of exclusion. Correct. And what that means is that we have to actually look at the victim, who in, in some instances, as you've said, will usually be the child, and we have to determine whether or not the child really does have some illness. Correct. Okay. And only after we've ruled out all of those potential illnesses are we left with the potential for Munchausen syndrome by proxy, right? Yes. Okay. One moment. Yeah. Now, going back a little bit to what you were saying earlier, the steps that you take to identify somebody who potentially suffers from Munchausen syndrome by proxy, one of the things you identified is that you would review the record. Yes? yes? What records are we talking about? Any and all medical records that are available. Any school records. Historical medical records. Any mental health records on any family member. Anything else? Basically anything that's available. Well, let, let me ask you this. These two articles that you relied on, the Cleveland Clinic and the Medline Plus articles regarding Munchausen syndrome by proxy, are those reliable resources? To me, yes. Okay. For, for your purposes? Yes. And in the medical community, are, are those generally accepted as being a reliable source of information? Yes. And both articles also tell us that real Munchausen syndrome by proxy is an exceedingly rare mental illness, correct? Correct. It's, I think, two out of every hundred thousand, something correct. like that, right? Yes. Okay. And yet, don't you tell us in your declaration that you have treated many patients, many families affected by Munchausen syndrome by proxy? I have treated, I have experienced in some way. That doesn't mean I had direct contact with them. I was involved somehow on the case. Well, let me read this to you. Perhaps you can explain it because it seems a lot more specific than just involvement. It says on page 2, line 23, I have treated many families affected by Munchausen syndrome by proxy, which is also called factitious disorder imposed on another. First, I'll show this to you, and we'll mark it as exhibit number six to your deposition. Did I read that correctly? You did. It doesn't say in there that you were involved in some way. But that's what treatment means to me. Okay. So to you, treatment means, or could mean, even ancillary involvement, right? Correct. Okay. You're not necessarily meeting with the patient, looking at the patient, talking with the patient, you may just be involved somewhere over on the sidelines. Correct. Okay, and that's treatment in your view? Correct. Okay. Now, according to your description earlier about the things that we look at to identify Munchausen syndrome by proxy, where's that note? I think it's this one here. You spoke about the mental and medical records that you would want to review, right? Right. And you would want to do as complete of a review as possible before jumping to some conclusion about this parent, right? Absolutely. Okay. You might even want to meet with the parent and speak with the parent, right? If I was treating or I was involved in that treatment. Okay. If you were involved in identifying that parent as being, um, as having, I guess, this mental illness, Munchausen syndrome by proxy. Yes. And then you also spoke about meeting with the team of doctors. 
right? If they're available. What do you mean by that, meeting with the team of doctors? Usually, by the time I've ever been consulted, involved, treated, whatever, there's been a long line of involvement in the medical community. Mm -hmm. So talking to those people who are either currently there or have maybe been there in the past. Okay. So we would, if, if we're looking at potentially identifying a parent as being, uh, you know, as having this mental illness that we're calling Munchausen syndrome by proxy, we actually want to go out and speak with the doctors that this person's dealt with, right? If I was asked to evaluate that parent. Well, let, let me ask you this, and this is irrespective of whether you yourself are asked, isn't it true that anybody who is going to tag a parent with that moniker, MSP, Munchausen syndrome by proxy, before they do that, they need to go out and talk to the doctors. If they're qualified to do that. What qualifications does it take legally to be entitled to tag someone with that MSP moniker? Legally? Okay, I do not know. Okay, you've been a DO for how many years? Too many. Um, <laughs> since 82. 82. And as part of maintaining your license for so long, you certainly had to attend regular continuing education classes, correct? Correct. But you're also the medical director of the County of Los Angeles Department of Children and Family Services, right? Correct. Proportion, percentage, how, how much of your income is generated off private work versus your county employment? I'm not sure. I mean, I can give you percentage. Yeah, that's all I'm looking for. 20%? Um, is private? Yeah. But Ever that's approximate. I really don't know. Yeah. Now, you said that you also testify as an expert in relation to your county employment. Yes. How frequently does that happen? I think maybe three or four times, including today. So three to four times total? Yes. And that's since whatever it was? 2000 and 2003. Yeah. Okay. Were those all in relation to juvenile dependency cases? No. Some of them were with the KDA stuff. KDA, yeah. what's that? It's a uh, class action lawsuit that the oh. county's gone through, you know that stuff. Right, that was the foster care. Yeah, 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 yeah. And mental health service delivery. Right. That was one of them, or how many was that? Maybe one or two. And maybe the others were cases, not of Munchausen's, but of cases. Have you ever testified in a Munchausen's case? No. So potentially any pediatric case that you see could be a Munchausen case. Could Munchausen be. by proxy. Could be. So every single case that you look out, because Munchausen syndrome by proxy is a very serious mental illness, right? It can be. It doesn't have to be. But it can lead to the death of a child, right? It can, yeah. Okay. But not often. That happens though, right? Not often. Not very often. No. Okay. In fact, it's very rare. You know that. that. Yeah. In fact, it's very rare, exceedingly rare. That's that why it's so difficult to diagnose. It is exceedingly rare for a child to actually die as a result of a parent suffering from Munchausen syndrome by proxy, right? I don't know for sure, but I would imagine yes. What does the generally accepted and respected medical literature tell us? It's rare. Exceedingly rare. Rare. Exceedingly well. Now, you've been with the County of Los Angeles as the medical director for DCFS for a long time. What's that, 11, 12 years? Yes? Approximately, yes. And in your time there, have you become familiar with the policies and procedures of the County of Los Angeles Department of Children and Family Services? Yes, I have, of course. Okay become familiar with them. And in fact, during the course of your work with the County of Los Angeles, <coughs> you have had occasion to see, for example, a juvenile dependency petition, correct? Correct. Okay. And you understand that the juvenile dependency petitions, those are also signed under penalty of perjury and that the phrase, I declare that the foregoing um, and all attachments here to are true and correct under the laws of the state of California, correct? Correct. Okay. Do you have any understanding what that means? When somebody signs something under penalty of perjury? 
that they need to be telling the truth. Okay. okay. Have you ever developed in your time with County of Los Angeles the understanding that when you make an unqualified statement, you say, for example, the car was black, that if that's not true, and you don't personally know it, you didn't personally see it, that's the same as making a statement that's false under the law. Have you ever learned that? I did, but I was giving an opinion. Let's talk about exhibit number four. The detention report. Detention report. Now that's signed under penalty of perjury, right? I think so. You turn to the last page of the detention report. You see a signature there? You're not quite there. Back one yeah. page. Right here. Yeah, you see signatures there, right? Yep. And directly above the signatures towards the top inch or two of the page, what does that say? I declare under penalty of perjury that the foregoing is true and accurate. Yeah, it doesn't say anything. There's no qualification there, right? It doesn't say to the best of my knowledge or based on information and belief, I believe it's true and accurate. It doesn't say that, does it? No, it does not. Okay, so there's no qualifying language, right? Right. And you understand the difference between a qualified declaration and an unqualified declaration because you yourself made a qualified declaration, correct? Correct. And if you need to, you can look at exhibit number six, the last page, page five. It says there, I'll just read it for us. You can tell me if I'm right or wrong. It says, I declare under penalty of perjury under the laws of the state of California that the foregoing is true and correct. Now this is the neat part, to the best of my knowledge. Did I read that right? Yes. yes. Okay. And the reason that you put in that little snippet, to the best of my knowledge, is because you have no personal knowledge of the material that's set here, set out in your declaration. In fact, what you're doing is you're rendering an opinion about facts that you learned from someone else, right? Correct. Okay. And that's why you put this qualifying language here, so that you were not making right. an unqualified statement. Right. Okay. Let's go back to your declaration for a moment. I think we marked it as exhibit number six. Yes. You say, right in the beginning, paragraph one, last sentence, as to those matters stated on information and belief, I am informed and believe them to be true. Okay. What, you, what were you trying to tell us when you wrote that? that? That one sentence. That's a qualification, right? Right. Okay. And those declarations that you relied on in forming your opinions, right. is there any similar qualifying language where, where I'm going to, or you would understand that those are qualified as opposed to unqualified statements under penalty of perjury. I have no opinion. Okay. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but you went and you, you reviewed the attachments, one of which was the detention report on Exhibit 4, right? Right. And because that was signed under penalty of perjury, of course, you believed what was stated in that detention report, right? Correct. And based on what was stated in that detention report, as fact, you formed your opinions in your declaration, right? Correct. Did you do anything at all, anything, to verify that the statements in the detention report were in fact true? No. Well, that's all if I'm you, asking for. I'm not asking to guess what somebody else's opinion is. I want to know what his understanding is. Of why this is a lawsuit? Is yeah, the basis saying? for the lawsuit. So that parents are appropriately treated, children are not removed inappropriately from their home, families are not disrupted inappropriately. And yeah, so lives don't get disrupted. In your entire time, in fact, with the County of Los Angeles as its medical director, am I correct that you have never heard it said that social workers are under an affirmative duty to disclose exculpatory evidence in their court reports? You've never heard that, right? I have, I'm sure, at some point. Do you give training to your workers regarding the, the damage that can be done to a child's brain when they are seized from their home? Yes. Okay, tell me about that. What do you want to know? 
what kind of damage can be done to a child's brain when they're seized from a child uh, parent's home. Well, what did you learn when you watched the video? It's, it's devastating. Okay, it's devastating when a child is removed from its parent's home, and that's whether there was abuse or not, correct? Period. Period. Okay. What do you mean when you say it's devastating to the child? Well, it's physically and emotionally devastating. From a physical perspective, it's, you know, changes in brain, growth, development. What sorts of changes? Neuronal changes, neurons. Neuronal changes. I, I'm, I don't know what you're going to have to educate Cells, me. you know, just the growth and development of the brain can be, def you know, affected when a child is removed from a home. And is that generally, or rather, is that referenced somewhere in generally accepted medical literature? Yeah. Okay. What, what are some of the articles that I would look for to... Mine? <laughs> um, Harvard has done some studies. I think Yale has done some. I mean, I don't have them off the top of my head. I can get them for you. They're in there, some of them. Okay. Okay. Do you often exaggerate to make a point? Depends. If I some, need to. Sometimes you do. I think everyone does. If you need to. I think everyone does. In fact, you're aware that uh, the law defines for us and for you and for your social workers the circumstances under which it is appropriate to seize a child from a home without first getting a court order, correct? Correct. Okay. Do you know what those circumstances are? Not off the top of my head. Okay. Based on your training and experience for the last 12 years as the medical director with the County of Los Angeles Department of Children and Family Services, is it appropriate to go out and seize a child without a court order when we're lacking sufficient information? I don't have an opinion. Okay. You don't know? I don't have an opinion. Do you know what the training is that you give your social workers? in that regard? Generally, yes, not specifically. Okay, what's that general training? What, what do you tell your social workers about seizing a child without getting a warrant when they don't have sufficient information? I'm not sure, okay. specifically. Just generally, that's all I'm looking for. Well, I think that they have to have whatever it is that they're told they need to have, and if it's a checklist of information or whatever it is that they need, or they have to get approval from their supervisor there is a chain of command or whatever that needs to be in place in order to do it. Okay. And what is the nature of the information that they need to be in possession of before they seize a child without first obtaining a warrant? Well, again, if I knew I would tell you, you're asking me for specifics. I really don't know them. Are you aware of whether or not the law specifically defines the type of information a social worker must have before they can seize a child without first obtaining a warrant? I do not. Okay. Let me see if I can help you. Uh, turn to the second page of exhibit number seven. And it says there a social worker's duty includes protecting the constitutional rights of children and families. That's the title of the slide there. Did I read that right? Yes. Okay. Have you ever learned or heard of that concept during your 12 years as medical director of the Los Angeles County Department of Children and Family Services? I've heard of it. I don't, not in these, necessarily these words, but yes. Okay. Or do you have any understanding whether or not, not that concept factors in, in any way to the work that you do as the director, the medical director of the Los Angeles County Department of Children and Family Services? My personal opinion? Your understanding of how that may or may not factor into your job. It factors into my job to teach and train and educate or opine on ways that I can help educate my workers or the workers so that they have the ability to make these kinds of solid decisions. Okay. Have you ever offered any trainings to your workers in the last 12 years um, regarding this concept about their duty to protect the constitutional rights of children and families? No. Okay. Have you ever heard of anybody in your entire 12 years with the agency, have you ever heard of anybody offering training on this concept that a social worker's duty includes protecting the constitutional rights of children and families? Not to my knowledge. Start the first part of that again, please. 
have you also learned, I'm going to have mercy on you, yeah. <laughs> have you also learned in your time as the director of the Los Angeles County Department of Children and Family Services, the medical director, that the government's interest in the welfare of children embraces not only protecting children from physical abuse, but also protecting the children's interest in the privacy and dignity of their homes and in the lawfully exercised authority of their parents. So you're asking me, have I seen this exercised? No, have you, have you learned that? I have learned it. In your 12 years with the agency? I personally have learned it. Hold on. Do you have any understanding that generally speaking, globally, the work that your department does and that you do is governed by Ninth Circuit law. Yes. I'd like you to go a couple more pages into exhibit number seven. The title of the document, just to make sure you're with me, says, how does this duty impact a CSW conducting a child abuse investigation. And let me know when you're with me. First of all, did I read that right? Yes. Okay. Well, when we're talking about the constitutional rights of parents and children, one of those rights, well, maybe you don't know, do you know whether or not one of those rights includes the right not to be seized from the child's home or parents unless there is a warrant or some other circumstance that justifies it. I don't know. You don't know. And you've never ascertained that knowledge in your 12 years as the medical director of the agency? Not to my knowledge. Okay. Well, if we look at this particular slide, it sort of answers the question it tells us a CSW will always need to determine if she, he needs a warrant or court order. Did I read that right? You did. Okay. Have you been privy to any training where this concept was taught to your social workers? No. Have you ever heard of any training be, being administered where this concept was taught to your social workers? Vaguely. Okay. When was the first time you heard of such training? Maybe years ago when I first got there. I don't do training there, so I don't know the components of the training. Well, didn't you tell... Other than what I'm responsible for, which is what you saw. Okay, and that's teaching your social workers that on those 18,000 doors they knock on per month, we don't want to just seize the child that night because it could cause serious and permanent traumatic injury. I give all kind of training that's medical or psychiatric. Okay, and that statement I just made, that was one of the trainings that you told in your video presentation, told the audience that you give to your social workers, right? Will give and trying to give. It's brand new, pretty much. Well, let me find that transcript. I mean, it may already be out there. I don't know. It's in a process. Did you film the presentation and publish it on September 11th, 2012? The department did. So let's move along to two pages into exhibit number seven. says, when a court order is required, I read that right, didn't I? Yes. Yeah. And it says, a CSW, and just a point of clarification, when we see this acronym CSW, is it your understanding that means children's social worker? Yes. Okay. That's what you call them in the DCFS, is children's social workers? Most of the time. Call them something else sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it says, a CSW must always obtain an order prior to, number one, entering or inspecting a home, number two, interviewing a child, number three is conducting a visual inspection of a child, number four is obtaining a medical exam of a child, or number five, removing a child from a parent legal guardian's custody. Did I read that right? 
You did. Okay. Just looking at this as a psychologist, psychi or psychiatrist, right? Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Psychiatrist. Better looking better at this as mother. a psychiatrist. Do you have any understanding what the significance of putting prior in all caps bold would be? Why would we do that? Maybe the typewriter was broken? Would we do it to draw emphasis? Absolutely. Okay. And the reason that we do something like that to draw emphasis is because it's an important concept? Yes. Okay. How long does it take to get a warrant in Los Angeles County, if you know? I don't know. Okay. Now, looking at the slide that's in front of you that we've marked, I think it was exhibit number seven, it tells us that exigent circumstances must exist if we're going to seize a child without getting a warrant, right? Right. Okay. Now, this particular child that we're talking about, the Duvall child, he came to the attention of the department, uh, what, sometime around October 20th, right? 2009? Approximately, I don't recall okay. the exact date. And the department uh, was working with the family for uh, roughly 15 days or so before they seized the child, right? Yes. Approximately. I don't know the exact, but approximately. Well, you reviewed the detention report, didn't you? I did. I just don't remember the exact number of days. Okay. Well, let's talk about this particular case. How quickly was this child going to devolve into a situation where he was in immediate danger of suffering death? It's honestly, it's very hard to say in any case. Mm -hmm. I think we let them stay for 15 days or so, as you said, but that's a long time to go without any real intervention going on. Well, in fact, this child, through your review of the records, you know, or should know, and tell me if I'm wrong, but this child, it was noticed that he wasn't gaining weight as early as March 2009, right? According to the records. And that continued all the way until November 3rd, 2009, right? Yep. Did you have, in reviewing your documents there, is there any indication from any medical care practitioner, somebody with a license, that this child was going to die within the next three to six hours if social services did not seize the child from the mother? Not from what I saw. Okay. Now, looking at this slide here that we've marked as Exhibit 7, page 20, it tells us exigent circumstances. CSW does not have time to get an order three to six hours because the emergency nature of the situation places the child at immediate risk of serious physical harm. Did I read that right? Yep, you did. Okay. Now, you know that the child went to the Failure to Thrive Clinic immediately that morning before he was seized from Ms. Duvall's care, right? Right. And that the Failure to Thrive Clinic they actually spent a substantial amount of time with both the mother and the child there that day, right? Right. They did not admit the child. Right. Okay. So they, they didn't put a G-tube in the child, right? Right. They didn't uh, give the child an IV and pump him full of fluids and nutrients either, did they? Not to my knowledge. Okay. And they didn't uh, put a hospital hold on the child whereby they restrained the mother's ability to take the child with her out of the Failure to Thrive Clinic, did they? Not to my knowledge. Now, if the child, in your medical opinion, if the child was there at the hospital that, at that moment in time right there, and he was so bad that he was at risk of immediate physical harm, Aren't those some of the things that you might do to help intervene and save the child? They might be some of the things that you would do, but not all of the things you would do. Let's just go through some of the symptoms of uh, possible warning signs for Munchausen syndrome by proxy. One of, one of them would be dramatic but inconsistent medical history, right? That's what's there, yes. And you agree with that, correct? Yes. Okay. Another thing we might look at is unclear symptoms that are not controllable become more severe or change once treatment has begun, right? Right. Okay, and you agree with that? Yes. Okay. Now, with a failure to thrive child in a Munchausen syndrome by proxy case, am I correct that once you remove the child from the, the um, mentally ill parent's care, you should see a rebound 
in the child's growth patterns? Typically, yes. Yes. Okay. So if the two workers, for example, say either in their declaration or in their reports to the court that were signed under penalty of perjury, that now that we've taken the child away from mom, he's doing great, he's growing, he's putting on weight, he's starting to develop, that's, where, that's the information that you would have. Based on what I was asked to perform in my role. Okay. And what were you asked to perform in your role? Make an opinion about okay. whether the detainment, based on the knowledge and information I was given, was appropriate. Okay, make an opinion about whether the, when you say de detainment, is that the seizure of the child? Yes. 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 Okay. You were requested to make an opinion about whether the seizure of the child was appropriate. Based on the information provided by their declarations. Okay. Did you request any information other than the information that they provided you? No. Okay. So you didn't request, for example, Dr. Yim's medical records? No. You did or you did not? I did not. Okay. Did you request uh, Dr. Gill's medical records? I did not. Did you request any of the metabolic studies done on baby Ryan? No, I did not. Okay. Did you request Dr. Berkowitz's medical records? No, I did not. Okay. Why not? Why didn't you request any of that additional information? Because I stuck to the clear definition of my role, which was to take these two documents and render an opinion. Okay. Was I, part of your role also to simply take what was stated in those documents at face value as true and then based on the statements in those documents being true, render an opinion? Yes. Would your opinion change if you were to learn that any of the statements in those documents were in fact false? Of course. Okay. Now, would it impact your opinion at all that you've rendered here in your declaration if you, actually let me just ask you to assume a hypothetical. Let's assume for the moment that Dr. Yim the child's pediatrician from zero to um, just under a year testified that no social worker from DCFS ever contacted her regarding the history of the child, number one, that she had no conflict with Ms. Duvall whatsoever, and that Ms. Duvall followed and complied with her recommendations. Would that change your opinion as rendered here in your declaration? Okay. In what way would it change your opinion as rendered here in your declaration if you were to learn that, in fact, Dr. Yim was the child's pediatrician from birth to just under a year, that she had no conflicts with mother at all, and that mother followed uh, and complied with Dr. Yim's recommendations? It would help me know that mom has the capability to comply and the strength to be able to do that. You understand that the, one of the bases of the lawsuit here is an allegation that the social workers, specifically Ms. Rogers and Ms. Pender in, in this instance, were dishonest with the court in the reports that they filed under penalty of perjury, right? Yes? Yes. You have to answer audibly. Oh, yes. Sorry. Okay. What does DSM stand for? Diagnostic Statistical Manual. When was DSM-5 first published? Like February 13, 2013, but I'm not sure exactly, but I think so. And am I correct that Munchausen syndrome by proxy, um, up until the publication of DSM-5, was not even a recognized mental disorder? By the DSM. By the DSM. Yes, you're correct. Okay. Am I correct? Well. Describe for me, what, what is the DSM? It's basically the Bible for psychiatric and mental health disorders. What do you mean when you say the Bible for psychiatric and mental health disorders? It is a book that contains all the diagnostic criteria for all the mental health disorders for every age, child, infant, all the way to geriatrics, so that there's a standardized way to diagnose similar to 
like what the American Diabetes Association does or whatever, so that you, you know, ADHD is ADHD has certain criteria that you can't just, you know, label somebody ADHD. It has to have certain criteria. So here and in New York and everywhere else, we all use the same criteria. Okay, so it, it helps to establish industry-wide standardization. Con yeah, standardization, yep. consistency, uniformity. Right. I mean, these are labels you don't want to just be throwing on people. Right, because they're serious. They have right. serious implications. Right. Like, for example, a Munchausen syndrome by proxy label could cause a mother to lose her child permanently. Yeah, or an attorney with ADHD or something. <laughs> or a doctor with ADHD. Sure, I understand. But in, <laughs> Yes, absolutely, in, you're correct. But they're very me, damaging. Because it is a serious issue. It is very serious. And, and let me ask the question again. When we label a mother as somebody potentially suffering from Munchausen syndrome by proxy, it has very serious consequences. It does. The mother, for example, could lose her child permanently. Absolutely. Okay. So it's critical, isn't it, doctor, that before we go out and suggest that a person suffers from Munchausen syndrome by proxy, we really need to rule out everything else. Yes, that's why it's a diagnosis of exclusion. Right. And if we don't rule out everything else before we start casting about these labels, am I also correct, doctor, that that sort of conduct is inappropriate? It's unfair. Um, I think you said it was unfair? Yeah, um, yeah. Why do you say that? Well, it's, n it's not good medical practice. And I assume you're asking me as a doctor and what my opinion of that is, not yeah. anybody else, yeah? Yeah, as a doctor, mm -hmm. as a psychiatrist, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, gotta be audible. Yes, yes, yes. What about in your capacity as the medical director of the County of Los Angeles Department of Children and Family Services? Is it, would it be unfair to a parent for your social workers the DCFS social workers to label the parent as suffering from Munchausen syndrome by proxy without first ruling out everything else? Would it be equally unfair? Yeah, of course, it would be unfair. Okay. And you mentioned it's a diagnosis of exclusion. We talked a little bit about that earlier today. Because it's a diagnosis of exclusion, consistent with good psychiatric practice, would it be appropriate for a social worker to not rule out all other possibilities before labeling a parent Munchausen syndrome by proxy? But to be clear, um, when you say labeling, mm -hmm. I'm not sure what you mean because they shouldn't, I mean, the only person that should be labeling is the doctor. Let me ask you this question. It's a hypothetical. If in her court report that she signed under penalty of perjury, or they signed under penalty of perjury, Miss Pender and Miss Rogers reported to the court that Miss Crump accused only mother, only mother, of impropriety with the child, would that make a difference in your opinion? Would that make a, a difference in your opinion? Possibly. As, as a psychiatrist, part of your job is to assess people, right? Correct. And when you're assessing people, one of the things that you do is, is um, judge their credibility, right? Yep because their honesty in reporting to you is, is critical to your assessment of them, right? Right. And if they're not honest in their report of events to you, it's very difficult for you to do your job in helping them, right? Totally. Okay. Yes. What the Cleveland Clinic description tells us for Munchausen syndrome by proxy, it's actually factitious disorder imposed on another, is that Individuals with this disorder produce or fabricate symptoms of illness 
in another under their care. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. is, that the yes. cor is that the correct definition of Munchausen syndrome by proxy? Yes, according to the Cleveland Clinic. Okay, and what about according to the DSM-5? Yes. Okay. So if the parent is in fact not producing or fabricating symptoms of illness, but the child is in fact ill, that does not fit the DSM classification for Munchausen syndrome by proxy, does it? Correct. Mm -hmm. So am I correct then, based on the DSM-5 and on this Cleveland Clinic article, that where the child in fact is suffering, for example, from a genetic disorder, we don't fit the criteria for Munchausen syndrome by proxy? Correct. Okay, so that's off the table. Yes, okay. Okay. Now, when we're talking about failure to thrive based on um, environmental factors, what does that mean? Uh, things outside the child's body, okay. basically. When we're talking about failure to thrive based on intrinsic factors, what does that mean? Inside the child, okay. often. So that would be synonymous with organic uh, causes for the failure to thrive, yes? Yes. Okay. Okay. Do you know who Dr. Carol Berkowitz is? I do. Who is she? She is a pediatrician in the South Bay who specializes in, I think, failure to thrive. I'm okay. not sure what her actual specialty is. Does she, actually, okay. Does she actually run the failure to thrive clinic? Yes. Okay. I think down at Children's. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure. I'm going to show you something, and I'm going to ask you what that means, because I'm, I'm having some, some problems understanding some of the things I'm seeing in this case. Okay. I'd ask you to turn to page 12 of Exhibit 8, and I have highlighted for you a sentence there at the bottom of the page. Can you read that for us? Dr. Berkowitz then said that Ryan's slow weight gain has intrinsic causes. What does that mean? that there is a portion of his weight issue that has to do with his own person, body, growth, something okay. organic. Okay, some organic cause. Yes? Yes. Okay. Anywhere in those court reports that you relied on in forming your opinions and conclusions in your declaration, do either Ms. Pender or Ms. Rogers tell us about Dr. Berkowitz's conclusions? Not that I'm aware of. In fact, they don't even mention Dr. Berkowitz. Correct. Is there some reason that you can think of why the social workers who are signing these documents under penalty of perjury, why they would not include Dr. Berkowitz's information? No. Yeah, I'd like you to turn to page 33 of Exhibit 7. And this one's really cool because it actually defines for us. If you recall earlier in your testimony, you were unable to define for me what was meant by the phrase exigent circumstances. Why didn't you just tell me to go there and I would have known? Well, you know, we got to work up to it. No immediate gratification. Right. <laughs> so anyway, this uh, page number 33, you see at the bottom there, it cites a case Wallace versus Spencer, Ninth Circuit, 2000. Right. 202F3-1126. Yes. And I'll represent to you that that date there, 2000, that is the date at which the law in regard to exigent circumstances was made perfectly clear to everyone residing in the Ninth Circuit. That being said, the slide is titled, Exigent Circumstances, Federal Definition. CSW can act without warrant slash court order if CSW has reasonable cause to believe child is in imminent danger of serious bodily injury and the scope of the CSW's intrusion is reasonable, reasonably necessary to prevent that specific injury. First, did I read that correctly? Yes. What specific injury was it that the social workers were seeking to prevent by seizing this child on November 3rd at the end of the team decision meeting? I have no opinion. 